uh, why does resveratrol activate the sirtuin enzyme? Why is that? So one idea is that we're sensing the stress and advers adversity of our food. But we also have hypothesized since we first discovered resveratrol and its role in aging, anti-aging, is that it's probably mimicking something that our bodies make. Mm -hmm. uh, we call it the endogenous activator, the elusive endogenous activator. And uh, what this paper showed was that uh, the byproducts of the, the what we call lipolysis, the breakdown of fat when you're when you're hungry, produces monounsaturated fatty acids, the kind that you can get from olive oil. Right. Those molecules circulating in the blood are about a thousand times more potent than resveratrol at mm. activating this longevity enzyme. So what does that tell us? First of all. Resveratrol is pretty cool. You can mimic your body's fasting state by by ingesting it. But also it means that uh, we kind of been vindicated because we, we got a lot of crap for resveratrol, uh, but we've always gone back to the bench and done better science because of those challenges. Mm. And one of the big challenges in my career was that resveratrol, we said it activates this enzyme by actually literally sticking to and binding to it physically and making it more active, like a Pac-Man would uh, move faster. And then a couple of companies came out, big big pharma companies, and their scientists said, literally, that is bull. Right. And that's brutal when that happens. And everyone, almost everybody except close friends said, oh, we're gonna believe the companies and David's wrong. And that that's a tough time in anyone's career. And my lab shrank down to about a fifth of its size and couldn't get grant money. But we fought back, uh, we, we, we went back to the bench, I got out of bed eventually, and uh, I had a student called Basil Hubbard, who's now a professor in Canada. He didn't give up. Everyone else in my lab was kind of like, oh, we're screwed, let's get out of here, sinking uh -huh. ship. He said, know what, you know what, I'm gonna test this. And he, he worked really hard and figured out that the, the experiment that we originally did to, to show that resveratrol was activating the enzyme in the test tube was not an artifact and that it was actually real. So we published that in the journal Science in 2013. And so the, the, the scientific hubbub went down. Mm -hmm. Basically, we, we were you know, largely accepted that we were co correct. But out in the media, you know, no, one, no one cares about correction of a right. scientific yeah, idea. Yeah, of course not. It's all about the controversy that's interesting. And so that's still out there in the world. So anyone listening who, who knows that this was controversial, we've actually scientifically resolved the controversy of, whether it's true or not, it is true. But it still left open the question, is there something in the body that we make that activates the enzyme like resveratrol? Well, I think the, the lipolysis we're gonna be doing with intermittent fasting anyway. But I think that the most exciting thing um, about the paper is that they found that oleic acid from olive oil is also a very potent nanomolar for the aficionados uh, activator of sort one. So what does that mean? That means that when you eat olive oil, you're actually activating your sirtuins quite potently because it's also just like resveratrol mimicking this lipolysis effect. And maybe the and I and the authors of that paper have written that this could explain why the Mediterranean diet is so healthy. Mm -hmm. So I've been taking resveratrol for over 10 years now and I'm glad I have. Uh, maybe I should have been taking a little bit of olive oil as well, but resveratrol has no calories. So I've basically been drinking res uh, olive oil for the last decade without the calories. Right. Yeah, so resveratrol is unfortunately a, a, a pretty insoluble molecule. Now in the plant, what they the plants do is they put a sugar on, on it mm -hmm. and it's quite soluble for the plant. But for some reason, we, uh, we like to purify it away from the sugars. Uh, well, not for some reason, because if you don't, it's it's a sticky, horrible mess. So we we isolate resveratrol that's free and clear of all these other bells and whistles that the plants like to stick on them. But what we're left with is basically a crusty, dry powder that doesn't get absorbed by the body very, very much. And even if it does, it gets basically gotten rid of by the liver. So what we had to learn early on, uh, even for worm studies, when we were showing resveratrol extends the worms, is you have to dissolve resveratrol in, in some sort of solvent. So for worms, we use a thing called DMSO. In humans, we found uh, in the early 2000s that you, if you mix it with a fatty meal, um, and that's true for mice as well, you get about five to tenfold uh -huh. the levels. And so I always 
mix my resveratrol with something that's got a little bit of fat in it, like a homemade yogurt every morning. And what I what I've noticed is that the studies in people that have not shown the benefits are the ones where they've just given a dry capsule to the patients or the subjects. And those that work are those typically that are given it with a meal or something that the resveratrol yeah. would dissolve it. We, yeah. we did these clinical trials a long time ago as we were working our way to making a drug. Um, and, but we actually, we ended up making synthetic molecules that were a thousand times more effective mm -hmm. than resveratrol. We didn't know at the time we were making the equivalent of olive oil, oleic right. acid. Right. But I guess now we, we do know that. Uh, those molecules actually went into clinical studies with, with humans. That's also not very well known. And there's a the skin condition, psoriasis. Um, it worked really well. They, they popped a pill of these activators and uh, one of these activators uh, and the patients did better. Now, I'm still hoping by the time I die, I'll, I'll have one of these medicines on the market. We're not there yet. Yeah. Um, and that's actually one of the, the brutal take home messages actually is um, I don't want to complain because I've been very lucky in my life. It's It saddens me that that in science, you can be derailed by a decade, for a decade, uh -huh. by a, you know, by your your naysayers, and I'm hoping to get things back on the rail. Seems like so far so. Good.